influences of pagan mystical prayer practices taken from Eastern and Gnostic mysticism are rapidly emerging and blending into mainline denominations and the evangelical church today. The Cloud of Unknowing was a treatise written by an anonymous author in the 14th century and was essentially a manual on repetitive prayer. In it, the beginner is told to take just a little word of one syllable rather than two and with this word you are to strike down every kind of thought under the cloud of forgetting. This method became the basis of all Roman Catholic mysticism with the understanding that in order to really know God, mysticism must be practiced and the mind must be disengaged so the cloud of unknowing, where the presence of God awaits, can be experienced. The theology of Roman Catholicism was developed by Augustine, who was an early church father. He adapted his brand of Gnosticism with the mysticism of Greek ascetics who lived about the third century. These hermits experimented with different types of meditative prayer and became the major proponents of various prayer methods, which eventually became part of the disciplines of monastic orders practiced in monasteries and convents where pious living was endured sparsely by certain luminaries. Today, these spiritual disciplines have entered many mainline churches under the umbrella of Christian prayer, known as contemplative prayer, centering prayer, or contemplative meditation, and have gained respectability in the emergent movement called vintage Christianity due to its so-called vintage status, viewed as something good because it's from the early church. But the early church is really the Roman Catholic Church, legalized over 300 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and mustn't be confused with the first church in Jerusalem that was begun at Pentecost. Emerging new Christianity promotes interspirituality as positive this push comes from Roman Catholics teaching of ecumenism, which promotes peace and unity above biblical fundamentalism. Before the 1970s, there would be like a reticence or even hostility to things coming from a Roman Catholic source within evangelical Christianity. But there's been kind of a letting down of the guard, kind of an openness to uh, Roman Catholicism that's uh, been increasingly apparent in evangelical Christianity. So now the idea of learning from the Roman Catholic mystical tradition is no longer seen as being heretical or out of place. And many, many evangelical uh, leaders, pastors have bought into Richard Foster's view that the, this mystical stream is, is very valid and legitimate for the spiritual life of evangelical Christians. In line with Richard Foster's goals, he continues to provide the evangelical church with mystical methods for what he calls transformed living. And the source he uses comes from the early fathers who influenced Roman Catholic mysticism teaching the presence of God is found in the silence which must be venerated. When I was a practicing Roman Catholic, we contemplated through silence on the idea of the presence of Jesus Christ himself being in the consecrated Eucharist displayed in a monstrance on the altar. Both Roman Catholicism's and Foster's mysticism promote panentheism, that God is in everything, the Eucharist, the silence, even in vacant contemplation. Such mysticism came through Augustine, the developer of Roman Catholic theology. He systematically allegorized the teachings of the Word of God and based much of his spiritual experiences on Greek philosophy, teaching the physical material is to be discounted and the spiritual mystical is higher knowledge. Gnosticism and Hinduism have much in common. They both practice asceticism, 
and subdue the flesh. Gnosticism hates the sinful flesh and both see they must physically put flesh under subjugation. Both view devotion to God through mystical experience and both view piety through prayer. The evangelical church has been deeply influenced by these teachings promoted by Foster. There was a book that came out in 1978 called Celebration of Discipline. It was written by Richard Foster. Uh, he also started an organiza organization called Renovare, which is Latin for renewal. And this book became extremely popular over, uh, over the last few decades. Something like two and a half million copies have been sold. Uh, in Celebration of Discipline, the practice of contemplative prayer is presented as the way to know God at a deeper level. Uh, Richard Foster says that we should all without shame enroll in the school of contemplative prayer. So he sees it as a very vital element in uh, spiritual growth and the current manifestation of this movement is called the spiritual formation movement, also known as uh, the spiritual disciplines, that if one wants to advance in holiness, one has to learn these spiritual disciplines. And this is done through spiritual formation, which is taught through spiritual directors. There are a multitude of teachers who are respected in the Christian world who have adopted ancient pagan belief systems and technologies and presented them as the latest and most important form of Christianity or who have gone back and called it vintage Christianity. People like uh, Richard Foster, well-known and beloved author among many in the evangelical church, who wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline, in which he teaches techniques that are straight out of occultism, techniques of guided imagery visualization, techniques on how to astral project, how to send your imagination and your spirit out of your body. And these techniques are being now disseminated through people like Dallas Willard, one of his co-workers in the Renovare movement, which is trying to bring back a Roman Catholic approach to the what they call the ancient disciplines that came from the ancient desert fathers. We got some teaching now right. that things have changed in recent years right. and that's a really good thing. I think the local churches uh, have to come to grips with this and right. especially they need to understand that what we would call church as usual is not adequate for spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they need, we need to begin as pastors and leaders in the churches to not only, we, of course we have to practice these things, mm -hmm. but begin to know our people well enough to lead them into the practices mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm to shepherd and teach them right. through the process. Because one of the uh, things that we were talking about earlier, the pitfalls, one of the main pitfalls is that people try once, it right. doesn't work, so, and they give up. Yeah, exactly. And that's where they need a teacher or a pastor or a friend to just step in and say, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You have to learn how to do it. Right. And you go through this and you go through that, and then they can begin to really tie into it. The magazine Christianity Today, which is the flagship publication for evangelical Christianity, has had a profound impact on softening up evangelical thinking on matters of, of mysticism. Um, they did an article on uh, the emerging church, which made reference to uh, Richard Foster as uh, <clears throat> one of the leaders of this movement, his book, Having the Most Influence. They also did an article on how the evangelical church is reaching back to the medieval period to bring out uh, lost treasures, so to speak, to revitalize evangelical Christianity. They gave it a very glowing endorsement. They said that wise teachers were guiding this movement and it was Christ-centered. So evangelical Christianity, when they see things like this in their flagship publication, identifying uh, Richard Foster and Celebration of Discipline as being the source for a, uh, for a couple of uh, major spiritual movements. They don't see anything wrong with the Roman Catholic mystical tradition. These articles in Christianity Today are making uh, note of something called the emerging church or ancient future movement. And this view is that younger evangelicals, those in emerging gener generations under age 35, are looking to the 
the past, uh, especially the, the Middle Ages, where you had various Catholic mystics such as St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, and that therein lies the key to having a fuller, more dynamic Christian life. What they call vintage Christianity actually isn't vintage enough. They don't go far back enough. They don't go back to the actual time of Paul and the New Testament writers. They only go to the ancient uh, time period of the Desert Fathers. That's where they've made their mistake. You know, they should stick with what is found in the scriptures. Thomas Keating is a Trappist monk who in the 60s realized that there was a tremendous influence of Eastern mysticism with the young people. He was very used to contemplative prayer techniques, having been a part of an order, the Trappist monks, who find contemplative techniques and mystical practices part of their very foundation. Thomas Keating began experimenting with uh, Eastern religion at a uh, monastery in Spencer, Massachusetts back in the 1960s. He took courses on transcendental meditation. He had Zen masters come in and uh, give classes there, but he also embraced uh, the Christian mystical tradition, which can be traced back to a, a group called the Desert Fathers. They experimented with this type of prayer, which involved repetition. The Desert Fathers picked up this form of uh, of meditation from Gnostic thought in the early Middle Ages. Thomas Keating, the major proponent of contemplative prayer in, in the world right now, wrote the foreword to a book called Christian Spirituality and Kundalini. And Kundalini, of course, is known as the serpent power within Hinduism. It lays coiled at the bottom of the spine and surges up through the chakras during meditation. Well, in the foreword, Thomas Keating says, Kundalini, or serpent power, has long been known in Taoist, that's Chinese occultism, Hindu and Buddhist spirituality. He then goes on to say that many, numerous people, numerous people, not some, but numerous people within Christianity who are practicing contemplative prayer are also undergoing kundalini awakenings. That really made it clear that contemplative prayer is not Christian, that contemplative prayer is part of New Age spirituality. In the 60s, Thomas Keating was inviting Zen master Roshi Sasaki to come and conduct contemplative retreats for the monks of his abbey. He wondered, however, if there wasn't a Christian perspective and a Christian way of reaching the young Roman Catholics who had such a yearning and a hunger for a mystical experience. He found a dusty old copy of a book called A Cloud of Unknowing, a mystical volume that was written in the 14th century and discovered that these practices by one of the early mystics and Roman Catholic contemplatives was virtually identical in substance and practice to the techniques they'd been learning from Zen masters. He took these techniques, simplified them, and popularized the movement called the centering movement, where you take a single word and begin using that as a mantra to focus and center your mind and your spirit through which you can open up and commune with the divine. And actually, Thomas Keating has acknowledged that that practice of contemplative meditation, even in its Christianized version, is identical to the Eastern meditation and will also, like the Eastern meditation, open up the serpent power, the kundalini demonic force, to rise up even in devoted young Catholics practicing these occult techniques. One individual that has had a tremendous impact both in uh, the emerging church and the uh, seeker-friendly movement is uh, Brennan Manning. He's written a number of books, The Ragamuffin Gospel, and he is a major proponent of contemplative prayer. In his book, The Signature of Jesus, he actually says that we have to stop thinking about God at the time of prayer. We have to change our consciousness. This is actually... Uh, required to hear God's voice and he talks about picking a word you know sacred word repeating it over and over again he says alone in the silence the voice of love will be heard people like Beth Moore and Amy Grant have promoted Brennan Manning a true lover of God once spoke about practicing God's presence to me that's such a part of contemplative prayer that we are able to absorb the reality. There was a DVD called Be Still. It was about contemplative prayer put out by 
uh, a number of Christian figures like Richard Foster, Dallas Willard, Beth Moore, a well-known Bible teacher pushing contemplative prayer with almost no warning about the dangers. Be still and know that I am God was taken from Psalm 46:10. That was the phrase that we used when we went into meditation in the New Age. We would say, be still and know that I am God. It's a crossover term. And that be still video, mystical, uh, longtime Christian proponent of, the, of, of spiritual disciplines, Richard Foster, said you can always tell the voice of Satan because it condemns and pushes away. You can always tell the voice of God because it draws you in and encourages. That is just totally bogus. Anybody that reads the Bible knows better. Satan comes as an angel of light. We didn't know we were dealing with Satan when we were in the New Age. It felt really good. In the Antichrist gospel, all this stuff is weaved together into this composite picture where people go, wow, I'm starting to get it. Everything's connected. The big word is connected. It's connected. It's one, oneness. 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits. Don't be one of those who's listening to a voice that's not God where you're being seduced and you're ending up with doctrines of devils which are now starting to pervade today's church. Many people who, f who object to uh, this uh, unity between Roman Catholics and uh, Protestants view Billy Graham's embracing of Catholicism as one of the avenues that has led to the acceptance of uh, Roman Catholic mysticism to a greater degree. Every single one of my sisters in this area attends a Lutheran church, which thrills me. These all attend a Methodist church. I can't tell you how I love that kind of diversity. Right back here, I want you to meet St. Anne's Catholic Church of Less Than Land. These ladies come Every single one of them, although they don't go to one Catholic church, every single one of them attend a Catholic church, probably right here in Houston. And I am so thrilled that they are here. Brennan Manning talks about a woman named Beatrice Bruteau, who is very much an advocate of interspirituality, that all is one, that all religions are the same at the mystical level. And Brennan Manning says that Beatrice Bruteau is a trustworthy guide to contemplative awareness. But contemplative awareness is new age awareness. Thomas Merton, a Roman Catholic Trappist monk, who was a famed author and contemplative. He used these techniques that were brought in by the ancient desert fathers, who adopted these techniques in the second and third century from the mystery religions in Alexandria, from the Buddhist brethren, from the Hindus. And they adopted the same Gnostic heresies that much of the New Testament was written on, that we have an inherent spark of divinity within all of us. Whether the, you know Jesus Christ or not is irrelevant. We all have this spark of divine. And by using these techniques, we can experience our godhood. If there's one individual that stands out in this controversy about whether contemplative prayer is truly Christian or not, it's Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton was a Roman Catholic monk who actually took contemplative prayer out of the monasteries and convents and spread it throughout uh, the Catholic Church as a whole and through him into the mainline Protestant churches and now into the Evangelical Church. Grace be with all of you who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Let's be quiet and ask the Lord to speak. Thomas Merton uh, viewed contemplative prayer as absolutely essential as to the salvation of the world. He said without it, the gospel can't go forth. He also believed that the pure glory of God was in every human being and that if we all knew who we really were, we would fall down and worship each other. That in the core of every person is this glory of God untouched by sin. Thomas Merton said, even though Muslims and Christians may differ on salvation, they can still both share in the divine light. And he says there, you know, in sharing of the divine light through meditation, that Islam and Christianity can meet and come together and have fellowship. Contemplative mystic Henry Nouwen, the late Henry Nouwen, 
who on page 51 of his book, Sabbatical Journey, commented that he believed that Jesus had come to open the door for salvation for everyone, but that he no longer believed that everyone had to know the name Jesus to enter by that door. The same kinds of teachings that Billy Graham in his later years can be heard teaching on YouTube, where he said to Robert Schuller, head of the Crystal Cathedral, oh yes, in my younger, rasher years, I believed everybody had to know and accept this Jesus to become Christian. I no longer believe that. I believe that you can come into the kingdom of God even if you don't know the name Jesus. Tell me, what do you think is the future of Christianity? I think everybody that, that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people for, out of the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. Uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved, and that they're going to be with us in heaven. This is fantastic. And I'm so thrilled to hear you say that. There is a wideness in God's mercy. But what about those faiths, the Mormons and the others that you mentioned, believe in Christ? They believe they will meet Christ. What about those like the Jews, the Muslims, who don't believe as That's you believe? That's in God's hands. I can't be the judge. You don't judge them? No. No, How I do you feel you're when, going to hell. And you're, well, I don't. How do you feel when you see a lot of these strong Christian leaders go on television and say, you are condemned, you will live in hell if you do not except Jesus Christ. And they, they are forceful and judgmental. Well, uh, they have a right to say that. And they are, they are true to a certain extent, but I don't, that's not my calling. My calling is to preach the love of God and the forgiveness of God and the fact that He does forgive us. That's what the cross is all about, what the resurrection is all about. That's the gospel. And you can get off on all kinds of different side trails and uh, when I, in my earlier ministry, I did the same. But as I got older, I guess I became more mellow <laughs> and uh, more forgiving and more loving. Henry Nowen was rated second only to Billy Graham among 3,400 U.S. Protestant leaders as to high, how highly regarded he was. Henry Nouwen was a Roman Catholic priest who uh, was a major advocate of uh, contemplative prayer. In his books, he claimed that uh, contemplative prayer was the way in which leaders of the future would turn to when they needed to make a decision. He used the term, we needed to move from the moral to the mystical, and that in the future, this would be the major mode of operation for Christian leaders, and evangelicals included. He wrote the foreword to a book by a Catholic priest named Thomas Ryan who went to India to learn yoga. And in this foreword he says the author, that's Father Ryan, brought home many treasures for the spiritual life of the Christian. And he even made it more specific that these came from Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim sources. So Henry Nouwen saw these other religions as being very much attuned to the type of spirituality that he was involved with. Tony Campolo, uh, in his book, Speaking My Mind, wrote uh, very favorably about uh, Henry Now and said, called him one of the greatest uh, spiritual leaders of the 20th century. Tony Campolo, who is a prolific author and frequent speaker at emergent conferences, he's touted as a great celebrity, and yet he promotes the works of panentheist contemplative Henry Nowen who is known for saying Jesus Christ came to open the door to heaven, but that all men, whether they know God or not, can walk through that door, whether they know the name of Jesus or not, isn't relative. That doesn't seem to bother Tony Campolo one bit as he promotes the works of this man who is a heretic and an apostate. Kay Warren, who is Rick Warren's wife, also wrote glowingly about Henry Nowen's book, uh, In the Name of Jesus. She said that she 
underlined practically every page. Well, this is the book that Henry now says we need to move from the moral to the mystical, that in the future Christian leaders would use the tool of contemplative prayer to uh, make the decision on what to do. Henry Nouwen visited uh, Eknath Eswaran's uh, meditation center in California and even endorsed the back of Eswaran's book on, on Hindu meditation. Also, he uh, made statements like, our souls are those sacred centers where all is one, and prayer is where we can come to the fuller understanding of the unity of all that is. Well, these are classic Hindu concepts, you know, all is one, unity of all that is. In other words, there's no such thing as good or evil or the kingdom of God, kingdom of Satan, that all is one, everything is united. He clearly, he clearly made contemplative prayer very respectable among evangelical circles. There are a multitude of teachers who are respected in the Christian world who have adopted ancient pagan belief systems and technologies and presented them as the latest and most important form of Christianity or who have gone back and called it vintage Christianity. Through these ancient occult techniques that have been adopted into the church, pastors and lay people have opened themselves up to becoming channels. And in fact, I have personally listened to some pastors talk about now being channels for God, where they believe that whatever comes into their head and whatever totally bizarre, blasphemous buffoonery they find themselves participating in, that it's God who's channeling through them. What they are channeling are spirits of demons. Brian McLaren is an absolutely huge figure in this emerging church movement. And he is also an advocate of contemplative prayer. He met and did a seminar with a professor named Marcus Borg at the Center for Spiritual Development in um, Portland, Oregon in 2006. And it was clear that this was part of an agenda to move contemplative prayer into the evangelical church. Uh, since then, Marcus Borg, who uh, sees Jesus as a spirit person and who practices mantra meditation and calls it that in his books, says that uh, Brian McLaren is a person that is merging uh, this new paradigm into the evangelical camp. Brian McLaren spoke at Willow Creek Community Church, one of the most influential churches in the world. is pastored by a man named Bill Hybels. And the fact that Brian McLaren would speak at this church indicates that Willow Creek has a proclivity toward this kind of spirituality. Two spiritual directors, which came out of Willow Creek, Ruth Haley Barton and John Ortberg, both have promoted contemplative prayer in their books. In fact, Ruth Haley Barton actually went to the Schlame Institute for Spiritual Formation, uh, which was founded by uh, Tilden Edwards, who said that this mystical stream, the contemplative prayer, is the bridge to Far Eastern spirituality. Tilden Edwards, the head of the Shalem Institute in Washington, one of the most prominent contemplative training centers in the country, has said, what makes a practice Christian or not Christian isn't its source, it's its intent. So what Tilden Edwards, along with many others in the emergent and contemplative movement are saying, is that we can embrace these practices, these principles, these teachings from ancient pagan mystery religions, sanctify them by sprinkling Christian terminology. If our intent is to honor God with it, then by definition they assume God will accept it and be pleased with it, not according to the word of God. The Word of God says they are bringing strange fire into the church, and it is an abomination to God. Michael Leach, one of the past presidents of the Catholic Book Publishers Association, wrote an article in America Magazine back in 1992. It was on New Thought Catholicism, an idea whose time has come, and he said in it, the best ideas in the New Age movement, the one concerning the universe, mankind, and God, have been gems in the Catholic treasury since the very beginning. In other words, he's saying that what we're seeing now in the Catholic Church regarding contemplative prayer, centering prayer, is actually part of the New Age spirituality that has been around for centuries. In essence, the evangelical critics of the Catholic uh, contemplative prayer movement have not misconstrued anything according to Michael Leach. He actually has no qualms about saying that the Catholic contemplative prayer movement is part of the New Age movement. Churches are being destroyed. 
because as they're practicing these things that are taught in so many of our seminaries, they're pulling away from the Word of God, the teaching of the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ, and they're spending their time now adjusting the atmosphere or meditating or using their mantras or doing yoga, which is taught in many of the seminaries today. Whatever it takes to have an experience at the expense of teaching the Word of God. Rick Warren promotes the work, the books, and the work of a man named Gary Thomas. Okay, Gary Thomas has written quite a few books on the subject of the sacred. He has a book called Sacred Pathways, Sacred Parenting, Sacred Marriage, and a few others, I believe. In Sacred Pathways, he has a whole chapter devoted to centering prayer and says that you need to take a word or phrase and say it over and over again for 20 minutes and that that will be a method that will propel you into the fuller awareness of God. Now Rick Warren actually endorsed the cover of Sacred Pathways and has had Gary Thomas speak at Saddleback Church. There's no doubt that uh, Rick Warren is promoting mysticism in the Purpose Driven uh, Life, the book which has sold over 30 million copies. Rick Warren makes uh, reference to Brother Lawrence. One of his contemporaries wrote that whenever Brother Lawrence would take his mind off God's presence, that God would jerk him back and make him sing and dance violently like a madman. Well, certain people I've shared this with have said, well, King David danced and sang, but this, this observer said that he danced and sang violently like a madman, which is more associated with the demonic realm than the godly realm. Brother Lawrence got his spirituality from St. Teresa of Avila, and I have read in various New Age publications that St. Teresa of Avila experienced the equivalent of Kundalini awakening. This coiled energy would shoot from the base of her spine up into her head, and she actually would levitate. St. Teresa of Avila was someone who displayed psychic powers, you know, third eye powers. What we're dealing with here is not something from the godly camp or the godly realm in the New Testament. We're dealing with something that came in through the back door. Gary Thomas, in his book, Sacred Pathways, in the end of the chapter on contemplative prayer, quotes a man named Basil Pennington. Well, Basil Pennington was one of the founders of the Centering Prayer Movement. And in one of his books, he said that we, you know, Christians or Catholics or whatever, should not hesitate to capture the age-old wisdom of the East for Christ. He also says that the Holy Spirit is the soul of humanity. The evangelical church has not been mystical before this, this time period. So the view is that if you bring in this mysticism from uh, this tradition going back to the Desert Fathers, that this will bring the church into full mature. Called the power of a whisper, hearing God and having the guts to respond by Willow Creek Church leader, Bill Hybels. The whole point of the book is that you need to do contemplative prayer and you need to hear what God will tell you and you have to have the guts to respond. That's pure Robert Schuller. Schuller used to say, I dare you. That's not, that's not God's language. He doesn't dare us to do things. He doesn't tell us to have the guts to respond. I think what you need to do is you need to have the common sense and the discernment to try the spirits and to test the spirits because everything that comes in is not from God. But reading Bill Hybels' book, there's not one warning in his book from 1 John 4, 1 about deceptive spirits. Bill Hybels has been right by Robert Schuller's side for years, you know, endorsing him, learning from him. And when Bill Hybels says in his book that God's been whispering to him since he was a young boy, and, and you look at where Hybels went for his teachings to the Crystal Cathedral and Robert Schuller, you have to wonder where those whispers were coming from. Alan Jones's book, Christianity Reimagined, he quotes someone who says that the cross is irrelevant, that it should be taken out as the central focus of Christianity. The cross is the central focus of Christianity. The cross is the, the hope of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The cross and the word, the the gospel is all that is necessary. There is no such thing as an esoteric element to real Christianity. Anyone who is born again, anyone who is in the body of Christ has the full measure of God's direction and guidance. Anyone who has the Holy Spirit within them 
has access to the Trinity. There's no such thing as you have to have some kind of an esoteric method, mystical method, which draws you closer to God. And that is one thing you find throughout the contemplative movement is that God can't reach you because you're always in your five senses. You're always thinking. You have to go into the silence to get God's guidance and direction, and that is completely untrue. Christians have to have faith in the word. The non-Christians have to hear the word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And what we have to understand is that in a mystical way of, of, of approaching God, it's all subjective. It's all what, what you hear in your altered states of consciousness. Jesus warned against, he said, don't learn the way of the heathen. You know, don't learn their methods. They, uh, they think that they're getting God, but they're not getting God. See, Jesus was not interspiritual. He was not someone who would uh, link mystically with pagan religions of his time. He was definitely not interspiritual. There was only one way to God. He said, straight and narrow is the way that leads unto salvation. And that is the only way to come to God. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. I hope you found Volume 2 helpful in understanding the problems and pitfalls of the new emerging Christianity, and I invite you to watch out for Volume 3 coming soon from Carol Productions, which will explore the new apostolic reformation, the signs and wonders movement, Christian Palestinianism, and more. For further information on these and other subjects to help you discern the times in which we live, as well as for additional resources including books, DVDs, and my autobiography, Out of India, please visit www.carrilltv.com. Thank you very much.